Um, welcome to our webinar today on gut health. My name is Sarah Bird. For those of you who may not know me, I am a nurse practitioner here at Palm trained in functional medicine. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic because I think it's really relevant to our health and well being. Um, and we're learning more and more about it every day. Just a few um, logistical uh, notes to, to take. If you guys have questions, I have a couple questions that came in beforehand and there is a QA. and a um, So if you have questions and we have time at the end, we will um, take a stab at answering those questions. If, you, um, if we run out of time and you still want your questions answered, I would love to do so. Just send those to news at palmhealth.com and we will get back to you with those answers. Now we're just gonna get started. Talking about our gut. So I always like to start describing what it is we're talking about, right? So what is the gut? The gut is the digestive tract that starts at the mouth goes down through the esophagus into the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then out of the body. It's really important for our health. And we're starting to understand that more and more um, in terms of the microbiome, but it plays a huge role in our health. We know that the surface area of the gut, if you laid it out flat, is about the size of two tennis courts. So it's quite a large surface area, much larger than the surface area of say our skin. It um, plays a big role in shaping our health and 80% of our immune system is actually in the gut. We also make 70 to 80% of our neurotransmitters in the gut. And if it's damaged, it can cause a lot of problems, not only because it has such a large surface area, but also because it's very permeable. So what does it do? It digests, breaks down and absorbs our nutrients. It also detoxifies. So that permeable membrane has to be pretty thin and it can be a lot more vulnerable to stressors. Um, and if it's damaged, it can cause a lot of problems. There is one organ um, that we're, or so-called organ that we're not actually seeing in this picture and that organ is the microbiome. And that's the really the focus of what we're gonna talk about today. So what is the microbiome? Microbiome is just the group of organisms in a particular environment. So it can include parts of the body, but it also, the, the plant behind me, for instance, has a microbiome. It includes mostly bacteria, but also fungus and sometimes parasites. In the human body, it's present in our skin, it's, it's in our mouth, our eyes, um, but also in our gut. And it plays a really crucial role in determining our health. So it can really shape our immune response or predispose us to disease. And it's really a symbiotic relationship that we have with these gut bacteria. So if you think about bacteria, They've been around a lot longer than we have. You know, if you look at evolution, humans came, came on the scene very, very recently, but bacteria have been around for trillions of years and we can't survive without them. We need them to eat, to breathe, um, to detoxify, but, but bacteria would be just fine if humans had never come along. So I think it's kind of an interesting perspective because we tend to get very focused on bacteria as bad and germs and, and dangerous, especially with everything we've gone through in the past year. But there's a lot of wisdom in the bacterial world. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about how, how it plays a key role in our health. So getting to know your microbiota, you have hundreds of trillions of bacterial cells in your body. If you compare that to the number of human cells, there's about 10 to one bacterial cells to human cells. And 95% of those are located in the gut. It's about two to 5%, I'm two to five pounds of your weight 
um, are actually those bacteria, but it's good pounds, so we don't wanna get rid of it. Um, and we actually have more bacterial genes in our body. So we have about 23,000 human genes um, that make up our DNA. And, but in our bodies, we have 1 billion bacterial DNA or genes rather. Um, so really, really um, quite a symbiotic relationship with these bacteria. In humans, um, the microbiome plays a crucial role. So it regulates local and systemic immune function, which we're gonna talk a lot about. It regulates metabolic pathways, plays a really big role in blood sugar, cholesterol metabolism, amino acids. Um, it regulates inflammation and prevents infection. So for example, if you get exposed to a GI bug, the bacteria in your body, the good, healthy, um, what we call commensal bacteria in your gut, they really like that spot where they're sitting, right? They really like that, that warm little gut pocket that they have. So if they sense with their sort of chemo receptors that there's a dangerous or a sort of um, invasive bacteria that you're exposed to, they will actually put out their own natural antibiotics and help you either avoid infection or clear that infection much more quickly. The microbiome also helps to regulate appetite, regulates bowel motility, can help prevent cancers, particularly in the colon. Um, they enhance our use of nutrients and they actually synthesize vitamin K for us. We're not able to do that without the microbiome. And they really regulate and balance our mood. And if you kind of think about this and you think about health and preventative care, you realize that you really need to be thinking about um, an appropriate consideration of individuals' microbiome to really engage in individualized care. So what happens if we have imbalances in the microbiome? So almost all inflammatory bowel diseases or um, bowel dysfunction is related to imbalances in the microbiome. Maybe not the, the entire cause, but very much um, related to that. Imbalances will also lead to autoimmune and illness, really linked with depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, and cardiovascular disease. So our understanding of cardiovascular disease has really changed um, over the past few years. Um, and we understand that really this is a disease of inflammation. And there are multiple ways through the metabolic pathways that the microbiome influence cardiovascular disease. But inflammation is one of the main mediators um, of cardiovascular disease and how the microbiome has a big impact. As I said, they play a role in diabetes, chronic fatigue and pain syndromes, and then also these degenerative diseases because the microbiome is really key to detoxification. So when things move out of our body, um, generally, they do so through the gut, and we need those bacteria to help detoxify. So if you aren't um, detoxifying efficiently, you get these degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and really almost all chronic diseases, if you look at the balance of the microbiome in individuals in those different groups, you, you find patterns of common microbial imbalance. In, in chronic disease. So it's kind of all chronic disease um, when we take a closer look. One of the early um, sort of pioneers of this research was a physician named Dr. Marty Blazer. And he was a, an infectious disease doctor who started seeing that there was this pattern of chronic illness that couldn't be explained through the normal mechanisms. And he really started researching the role that antibiotics play in the development of complex chronic diseases because of the effect that they have on the microbiome. So for example, we know that type one diabetes has been doubling in incidence about every 20 years since the 1950s. And that's when we started to see more widespread use of antibiotics. In Finland, where they have really meticulous um, record keeping, they actually saw an increase in type one diabetes. So type one diabetes is that 
autoimmune type of diabetes that's more common in children, but now we're seeing in adults as well. So from 1950, they've seen a 550% increase in the incidence of autoimmune diabetes. So, you know, this, this theme is, is not uncommon in our other autoimmune illnesses. And also things that we've talked about like metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease. So what Marty Blazer says about this is that it is reasonable to propose that the composition of the microbiome and its activities are involved in most, if not all, of the biological processes that constitute human health and disease. And the mammalian system, which seems to be, I'm sorry, the mammalian immune system, which seems to be designed to control microorganisms is in fact controlled by microorganisms. And I'm hoping that as we talk and we kind of go through some of these systems, I can illustrate for you what, what he really means by that. So the microbiome and immune function. We're still learning about how these two systems or how these two you know, organs interact, but we know that one of the key ways the immune system um, is impacted by the microbiome is, is through its development. So we know that the microbiome acts as an educator or start, educates the immune system when we're born. So when you're born, your immune system knows nothing, right? It needs to have good, healthy bacteria to teach it that not all bacteria are scary. And if it, if it has healthy bacteria around, or what we call commensal bacteria, it's gonna have a really nice, good, healthy set point. So it reacts to the things that are dangerous. And then if there's something that's not as dangerous, it says, okay, we don't need to react to that. But if you have an imbalance in the microbiome or you haven't had good education of that system from a young age, the body will overreact to a lot of different things and that creates inflammation. That inflammation there, therefore creates more inflammation. And then you get the immune system that's starting to attack your own tissues. And that's what we call autoimmune disease. So it not only plays a role in education, but it also um, can have an effect on how the microbiome itself develops. So the things that we're exposed to early in life can create a certain composition of the microbiome that can shape a healthy immune response or predispose us to disease. So like it says here on the screen, for example, the mode of delivery is one way that um, the microbiome um, can, can be affected. So when a baby is in the womb, the, the, the microbiome doesn't exist, right? That's a sterile environment. As the baby goes through the birth canal during labor and delivery, it gets inoculated with the microbiome of the mother. However, if a child is born via C-section, it doesn't get that inoculation. And that can lead to what we call dysbiosis and kind of predispose that child um, for illness. So now we're seeing some physicians that will actually, you know, use interventions to try to inoculate those infants that are born via C-section. We also know that individuals given antibiotics at a young age are much more likely to develop um, inflammatory bowel disease. And the accumulation of pathogens as you age can also tip the scales. So it's a dynamic relationship. Um, it doesn't just affect us when we're young. We know that a common factor in autoimmunity and impaired immune response is always dysbiosis and leaky gut. So I'm gonna talk about leaky gut. Leaky gut or intestinal permeability as it's known sort of in the medical world happens when we have an imbalanced microbiome. So when we have a healthy digestive system. The way that that works is that you chew your food, it goes into your stomach where it starts to be broken down and then it moves into the small intestine because it's not fully digested yet. So it needs to continue to be digested as it moves through the small intestine. And then when it's properly digested, 
you have this good, healthy cell wall that will say, okay, that looks like a nice digested food particle. I'm gonna bring that in and use that for fuel. What you're not seeing in this picture is a nice healthy layer of mucus that resides on top of the, the gut wall, right? So that, that mucus layer is really important to protect the cell wall because as you can see, this is a single cell layer. So to absorb our nutrients, we can't have something super thick for the, for the food particles to go through. So that mucus acts as a second layer of protection. But when you have um, a microbiome that's dam damaged, you get a, a sloughing off or, or a loss of that mucus layer. Then these um, cells of the gut wall are very vulnerable to the different um, insults that we, we expose our guts to all the time. So things like um, the SAD diet, the, the, the standard American diet that's high in saturated fats, low in fiber and high in refined carbs. That's hard on the gut. Also medications, um, alcohol, pesticides and toxins that we're exposed to all the time, that will start to damage that gut wall. And then when you're eating your food, you don't have the same barrier integrity. And when the barrier integrity is broken down, you get foods and other pathogens that are leaking into the body and into you know, that big chunk of the immune system that's located in the gut. And when that happens, first of all, all of a sudden the immune system starts to see all this stuff coming through and it starts to freak out a little bit. And it will start to actually make antibodies to those larger undigested food proteins. And then when you're eating those food proteins regularly, they will leak through that gut barrier and the immune system will tag them with antibodies, which is just the way that says, this is dangerous, we need to fight it. And the immune system starts to mount an attack on our food. That increases inflammation, increases um, autoimmune incidence, but also you know, for a different individual, it may just increase inflammation in another way. So leaky gut is one of the main mechanisms that um, autoimmune disease and inflammation play a role, um, play, have, have a sort of a relationship with the microbiome and the gut. Now, what about the microbiome and mood? This is another area where we're seeing a lot of research because there's, there's a lot of really hopeful findings. So the gut-brain axis is the name that we give to this bi-directional communication system between the brain and the gut. So between the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system, or even gut-brain as, as we call it now. And we used to really think of this as a gut on brain, I mean, I'm sorry, a brain on gut effect where you would perceive stress, you would sense that in, in the sort of um, limbic system of the brain and the brain would send out neural hormonal signals and that would cause maybe some GI upset. What we understand now is that this relationship is really bi-directional and that there are just as many messages going from the gut to the brain in terms of stress and um, anxiety and all of these sort of signals that we need to be afraid. And some of that is actually mediated by the microbiome. So in looking at um, the microbial changes, when somebody undergoes a period of stress, it's actually the shift in the microbiome that they are, sorry, that they are finding causes a lot of the GI, GI distress symptoms. One of the first studies that kind of looked at this relationship between the gut and the brain was done in 2004, and it examined the stress response in the autonomic nervous system of mice um, that had gut bacteria, no, like a normal commensal gut bacteria versus those that had no gut bacteria. So they're able to breed mice without any gut bacteria. And what they found was that the mice that had no gut bacteria had a very exaggerated response to stress. So we call that the CNS function, where 
if they were exposed to a stressor, their reaction was much more extreme than the exposure of the other group who had a normal microbiome. And that persisted that um, once they re-inoculated these mice with a good healthy microbiome, the over-exaggeration improved, but it didn't totally go away. So we know that in the same way that the microbiome helps to educate the immune system, it also is helping to educate um, our central nervous system and our stress response. So for good, healthy resilience and a modulated response to stress, we need a healthy microbiome. One of the ways that they think the microbiome is playing a role is in the production of neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are those chemicals in the body that send signals and really can have a big effect on our mood. And serotonin, many of you might have heard of that, is the neurotransmitter transmitter, um, that we target often with our antidepressant medications and we know helps people feel less anxiety, improves mood. Um, and Another mouse study that they did, they took two groups of mice with healthy microbiomes, measured their serotonin levels. Then in one group, they, they basically removed the microbiome and remeasured the serotonin levels. And their serotonin levels decreased by 60%. So a pretty significant drop. But the cool thing was when they went back and re-inoculated those mice, their serotonin levels came back up. So, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of hopeful data here. We also know that when patients have depression and anxiety, they actually have a different pattern in the microbiome. And these are humans, right? So we do have some human data um, showing that um, the microbiome really show up in a different pattern. And they've even started isolating particular bacteria that are more common in people with anxiety and depression. So, you know, it kind of goes back to the fact that, to the question that Marty Blazer asks, you know, are we controlling them or are they controlling us? What about metabolism? Does the microbiome affect metabolism? As you can imagine, it does. Um, in this study, they took human twins that were genetically identical twins but they found twins that where one of the pair was overweight, actually obese, and one of the twins was lean. And they took the microbiota from those twins and they transplanted them to two groups of mice. So one group got the microbiota from the obese twin and one group got it from the lean twin. And with the exact same diet, low fat, low fat high fiber diet, they saw that the mice that got the microbiome from the obese twin actually became at a, you know, overweight and obese themselves. And the lean um, mice that received the, the microbiome from the lean twin um, stayed lean. So, you know, it's very interesting and it kind of begs the question, what's the mechanism? So we know that the pattern of the microbiome is different in those that are overweight and obese. Um, it's a little bit of a chicken of the egg um, sometimes because we're not really sure, <coughs> pardon me, um, if having an imbalanced microbiome maybe makes you crave sugar and high fat. <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> okay. Um, we know that in individuals that are overweight, they have a different pattern of microbiome. But also if you eat a high fat, high saturated fat, high sugar diet, it will actually change the composition of the microbiome. We know that <coughs> calorie intake affects microbial, is affected by the microbial makeup. 
So certain uh, microbes are very, very efficient and certain microbes are not efficient. Well, those very efficient microbes don't eat as many of our own calories. Those less efficient microbes will take up a lot of our calories. So we actually want those less efficient microbes because they're gonna eat up more of our own calories and we absorb less. Another factor is definitely antibiotics. So anyone that's familiar with the cattle industry knows that we use antibiotics to keep our cattle um, germ free, right? But what is less well known is that another reason antibiotics are used is because they make the cows gain weight and not just any weight, but if they really create that like marbling on your steak, sorry to say, that is actually kind of atherosclerosis in a cow, right? So it makes sense that like the same types of things can be happening in the human system. When we kill off the good bacteria, causes us to gain weight, raises inflammation, increases diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease. <coughs> Pardon me. The other aspect is epigenetics. So as I mentioned earlier, we have 1 billion um, bacterial cells in our body. And if you don't know what epigenetics is, it's basically the concept that when we're born, yes, we have a genome and that doesn't change, but the expression of that genome can change based on our environment. And a key piece of that environment is our microbiome and the gene expression of the microbiome. So we're starting to understand that as they send chemical signals through our body, good or bad, that has an, uh, an impact on our gene expression. And then the presence or absence of certain gut bacteria really affects our insulin sensitivity. So some bacteria can reduce the sensitivity of the cells to insulin. And it has to do with that neurohormonal signaling. We're not quite understanding that as well. Um, at, at, we, don't, we don't understand that completely, but we know that it has an effect. And then cholesterol metabolism, the absorption and production of cholesterol also is affected um, by the microbiome. So just to be really clear, I wanna talk about what dysbiosis is because I've been mentioning it a lot. So dysbiosis is just any microbial imbalance of the gut and it can include um, a lot of different patterns. So one is just a lack of good bacteria, right? If you don't have enough of the good bacteria, um, you're not gonna be uh, managing that, um, that sort of inflammation, that good gut barrier. You may have too many pathogenic or bad bacteria. So those bad bacteria are pretty powerful. And, and like I said, we're starting to really kind of even understand the way that specific strains are, are impacting specific diseases. You can have a lack of diversity of bacteria. So you may have a lot of really good, say, lactobacillus, but if you don't have other good bacteria as well, that's going to have an impact on health. You can have something that we call SIBO, and that's where you have too many bacteria in the wrong place. And that, so SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And what happens there is that in the small intestine, we actually have a lot less bacteria than the large intestine. So in the large intestine, we want a lot, like I said, trillions. In the small intestine, we just want like a few hundred thousand, right? But if you have constipation or things that can cause a backup, then you can get too many bacteria antibiotic use to, too many bacteria in that small intestine. And that can really cause a lot of bloating. It can cause a lot of um, issues with digestion. And um, so then we have to address that. You can get yeast or fungal overgrowth, often again caused by, by antibiotic use because what happens is you, you have yeast in your gut naturally, and that's okay to have a little bit in there 
But if you take antibiotics, they go through and they just wipe out all those bacteria. And the yeast are like, hey, this is great. It's just us, we can just take over. Um, and that becomes a problem because it's hard to rebalance um, the bacterial um, fungus balance. And then sometimes you can get parasites and those really come from a variety of different places. So what causes this dysbiosis? You can have a, a genetic predisposition to, to dysbiosis, um, but you also can have events early in life um, so things like being born via C-section or having antibiotics. The SAD diet, as I mentioned, low in fiber, high in fat and refined carbs. Those fake sweeteners, oh, the diet soda, um, you know, really just wreaks havoc on the gut microbiome. Um, sugar is, the, the bad bacteria love the sugar. And so when you have a lot of sugar in your diet, those kind of grow up and they will actually send signals to the brain, give us more sugar, give us more sugar. So part of the mechanism for sugar creating more sugar cravings is the microbiome. It also has to do with blood sugar, but we know that they'll send those signals to the brain. Hey, give me some more sugar. So pretty powerful. Um, Medical treatments definitely have an effect on our microbiome. Antibiotics and vaccines, which obviously we need, um, but it's just a matter of being aware of how this might affect the microbiome and thinking about that when we have to use these things um, in order to protect our microbiome. Also, all the hygiene, you know, all of our um, antimicrobial antibiotic. Um, even just soaps, we think, especially after this past year that we're really protecting ourselves, but they've become so widespread that we start to get super bugs that are bad for the, the microbiome. And we also have kind of killed a lot of the good bacteria in our environment. Other things like surgery um, and even just having a stressful um, medical event can shift the microbiome. Chronic poor digestion. So this, this one I'm gonna actually talk about a little bit more. So if you have been on a lot of those proton pump inhibitors for acid reflux, um, that can definitely contribute to chronic poor digestion. And um, what's happening there is that often, almost, almost always with acid reflux, it's not that individuals have too much acidity, which is the common misconception and the common sort of problematic way it's often treated, but often people don't have enough acidity to break down the food. When things are working well, stuff goes into the stomach, you have enough acidity and then goes, it gets broken down. And at the right moment, because your body has all these ways to sense it, it will move into the small intestine, right? And that pyloric sphincter will only let it through if it's properly digested. What happens with low stomach acidity, especially when you start adding proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec, is that the amount of acidity in the stomach greatly goes, reduces, right? So you have food you, you, um, that you'll eat and it'll just kind of sit in the stomach and it doesn't get broken down enough. So it just keeps sitting in the stomach. And then it starts to putrefy a bit and it'll just start talking back, right? So often what we do for patients that have chronic GERD, if they're not on proton pump inhibitors because that can take a while to, to sort of wean off of those, we'll actually give them some more stomach acidity and that will help them break down their food and resolve that acid reflux. So it's very counterintuitive. People are like, oh, I have so much acidity and then we give them more acid and then, you know, often that relieves their symptoms. So with chronic poor digestion in terms of the microbiome, what we see is that if you have undigested food that's going into the small intestine, first of all, um, it causes, an, you know, damage to the gut microbiome and damage to the gut lining but you also have the opportunity for more pathogenic bacteria to get through. 
because the acidic in the environment of the stomach is protective. Additionally, you're just not digesting your food as well. So that puts at you, you that puts you at risk for other um, chronic illnesses just from lack of proper nutrition. Um, chronic constipation, as I mentioned with SIBO, um, can just start to cause some imbalances in the small intestine. Stress, fear, and anger. And this is one that I just want to stop on for a minute and make sure that I give this enough, um, enough emphasis because the chemicals in our bodies that come with stress, fear, and anger are really not good for the gut and not good for the microbiome. So they tend to promote the growth of negative, negatively effective bacteria and really suppress the growth of good, healthy bacteria. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, it's not the focus of this talk, but I really want to, you know, encourage you all to to work on your stress and and managing your stress, your fear, and your anger because it is a really important part of gut health. Um, infections, infections like a GI bug that I mentioned earlier, sometimes those can really wipe out your your gut microbiome, and that will be sort of a trigger that we can look back. Um, when somebody has developed chronic disease and say, oh, hmm, everything started going, going bad, or I started to really have worse symptoms after I got that GI bug on that trip I went on. So that can be a difficult to recover from, but if you have a resilient microbiome, that really helps. And then <clears throat> all the toxins that we kind of are exposed to on a daily basis, um, cigarette smoke and pollution, um, also though the pesticides on our food, um, and alcohol and coffee all have a negative effect on the microbiome. So what are the symptoms that you may have if you have dysbiosis? So obviously you have these digestive abnormalities as a common symptom, right? Things like constipation, diarrhea, bloating after meals. Acid reflux, another really common one. <clears throat> Abdominal pain, especially um, after eating. And if you find you're starting to become more and more sensitive to foods, that's a really um, good sign of leaky gut and dysbiosis. But the other things that we often see are that we can have inflammation in the body, but really no digestive symptoms. But then when we go and we look at what's going on in the microbiome, there are major imbalances. So some of the things, but this list is not exhaustive. Um, some of the things that you might see are chronic rashes, um, pain in the body, but especially in the joints and muscles, sometimes some stiffness in the hands, allergies, autoimmune disease, um, metabolic syndrome and heart disease, diabetes, Migraines and headaches are another really common one. So really, again, sort of this overarching, um, this overarching signs of inflammation in the body. So how do we, how do we build a healthy gut, a healthy microbiome? The answer, if you're ever wondering, the first answer is probably always food, 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 food. Um, and that's great because we have so much power over what we eat, right? So we have pre and probiotic foods, which we're gonna talk about diversity of our foods and then soluble and insoluble fiber. The diversity of our foods is really interesting because we need diversity in our microbiome. And if you look at the patterns of the microbiome and those that eat a more diverse, um, a diverse diet, you have a lot more um, diversity in the microbiome. So they did a study in Ireland where they wanted to follow individuals that were aging and monitor their microbiomes. And so they followed um, sort of this aging population as they moved from their homes in the community to their homes um, to like a short-term rehab or even long-term care facility. 
and they noticed a drastic decrease in the diversity of their microbiome. They just became more and more sort of the same, the same bacteria. And when they looked a little closer, they found that the dropping diversity of their microbiome was correlated with the decrease in the diversity of the food that they were eating. You know, so if you think about the foods that we serve in our short-term rehab and our long-term care facilities and our hospitals, you know, it's a lot of brown food, a lot of starchy food, um, not too many dark leafy greens, not a lot of um, colors. And it just makes us think a little bit about what we're doing to the microbiomes of these people that we're trying to help heal. So I'm hopeful that as we learn more about the microbiome, that we become a little more thoughtful about um, the food that we're giving people, because it really is its own therapeutic intervention. We can also build a healthy gut by making lifestyle changes. Um, as I said, stress, fear, and anger are not good for the gut. And then sometimes we need to use supplements or a little more advanced treatment. So a nutritionist um, that wrote a paper about this said, diet has the most powerful influence on the gut, sorry, this is cut off, on gut microbial communities and healthy human subjects. About 75% of the food in the Western diet is of limited or no benefit to the microbiota in the lower gut. Not terribly surprising, but still that percentage is pretty impressive. So here's a study that really illustrates that done by the ever popular Dr. Oz. So what Dr. Oz did was that he had um, two groups of patients or, or you know, participants and he, he had them eat two completely different diets. So in one group, he had them eat the vegan, um, completely vegan plant-based diet on the left or the right side of the plate. And the other group he had eat a diet that was all based on eggs, meat, and cheese. And what they found was that after just three days of eating these um, very different diets, that there were major changes in the gut microbiome. So as you would imagine, the group that ate the plant-based diet had great improvement in their beneficial bacteria. But the group that ate the um, cheese, egg, and meat-based diet had a decrease in beneficial bacteria and an increase in those more harmful or pathogenic bacteria. So really interesting, right? Just three days, that's pretty hopeful. The downside of the study was that three days after stopping the study, all of the effects of the study, even for that plant, plant-based group um, were gone. Those, those effects ceased after three days. So all that to say, you can really create a great shift in your microbiome, um, but you can't just do it for a week. You know, this gut reset for a week, we're gonna detoxify the body, we're gonna, you know, clean out the gut. Yeah, that might be really good and a great reset, but it's really about consistency. And I do think, you know, if you're eating a good healthy diet with a lot of vegetables for three years versus three days, you're not gonna lose that effect in three days, but consistency is important, right? So what are the foods that really are the most beneficial for the microbiome? Fermented foods are fantastic because those are probiotic foods, meaning they actually have live bacteria that are beneficial to the gut in the food. So things like kefir, which is like a, a sort of yogurt drink, yogurt. And if you're sensitive to, to dairy, there are a lot of non-dairy yogurts now. Um, sauerkraut and pickles, but the ones that are in the refrigerated case, okay? Because those are the ones that have the live cultures. Kombucha is fantastic, but if you have never had kombucha, 
Um, I would recommend starting out small because they come in these really big, like 16 ounce bottles. And you will find that if you drink a whole bottle of kombucha and you haven't had any um, before, you may have a sort of pretty strong gut reaction. A little less common um, to us are kimchi and poi, especially poi. Poi is a fermented um, food from Hawaii that you'll often see at a luau, but it's very interesting, but it's really good for the gut. And then miso, tofu, tempeh, these fermented soys are great. Soy has gotten a bad rap, but the fermented soys are so good for the gut. You can even buy miso paste and almost make like a little tea out of it and just have a little bit every day. You're really gonna help um, support that gut microbiome. What about prebiotic foods? So prebiotic foods, are not foods that have live cultures in them, but they support the growth of the good bacteria that are already in your gut. So these are things like root vegetables, jicama, turnips, beets, but also onions and garlic, mushrooms, um, dark leafy greens, really, really good for the microbiome. And to be honest, I really consider pretty much all vegetables to be prebiotic because if you're eating diversity, you're gonna have diversity in your microbiome. So just vegetables is the key, right? Now, I often get the question, should I use probiotics or should I use food? And the answer is usually food or both. And the reason is, is that probiotics are like um, are similar to sort of the three-day diet and that once you stop using them, the bacteria that's present in the probiotic, which is very beneficial, is not gonna remain in your gut. So if you stop taking it, it's, it's not gonna be there anymore. It's not like you're like planting the seed of the probiotic in your gut. However, we do often use probiotics because they can really help we help quickly shift um, sort of the inflammatory process in the body. We give people a lot of probiotics, especially with inflammatory bowel disease, it can really calm that down quickly. Um, it also can act as sort of a placeholder. So kind of as the, the police that are kind of keeping the peace to allow the good healthy bacteria to grow. So you, you kind of can think of it like, almost like a vitamin, like if you take it, that's great. But once you stop taking it, you're not gonna have it in your system anymore um, in the same amount. So yes, we like to use probiotics, but always with food, always with food. And then sometimes probiotics and food aren't quite enough to really treat the gut. So you may need treatment beyond probiotics or individuals may. Um, and that's when we start to kind of do testing to see what's going on. So often we can tell that someone has a pattern of dysbiosis, but we don't know which of those patterns is really happening for them. So testing to look at the microbiome in leaky gut can be helpful. Sometimes we'll find that they have high levels of a certain bad bacteria and we need to treat that and get rid of it. Um, so, if you're more interested in that, you know, food is always great, but if you're interested in finding out more about sort of the specifics of your microbiome, you know, if you're a member of the Paul Medical Clinic, I would encourage you to talk to your provider. Um, and if you're not a member of the Palm Medical Clinic or you're not even a member of Palm, we are now offering a precision nutrition program, which I'm really excited about because it's a program that combines a lot of lab testing that will allow us to see your micronutrient levels and your microbiome and, and leaky gut, food sensitivities. And then that combines that with um, several visits with me to help interpret that and um, kind of make recommendations that are a little more personalized. So if you're interested in that, there is more information on the Palm website. Finally, people always ask, so I included it, 
We sometimes will do fecal transplants, plant, tan, transplants for severe infection. So this is when somebody um, gets a really bad infection in the hospital like C. diff. So C. diff is an infection that generally you only get when you're in the hospital that causes severe diarrhea and people get really, really sick with it. And one of the best treatments they've found is a fecal transplant. Other times we do use it um, under the care of a physician. I, I don't recommend, there's a lot now online. I only recommend doing this under the care of a physician, but people with chronic imbalance in the microbiome that don't respond to the traditional treatments will do fecal transplants. Um, and, you know, it's not our favorite thing to think about, but it's very effective. And so I just, I had to include this, this um, cartoon uh, because first of all, we couldn't get through a whole talk on microbiome without at least one poop joke. I'm so sorry. And also because we have to, we have to laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves too seriously, right? Which leads us to our next topic, which is stress management for the microbiome. So <clears throat> if we think about stress and the microbiome, it's really that stress that exists in the body, right? <clears throat> Which I'm having right now because I'm coughing, right? <clears throat> but often what we see is when somebody is really, really stressed, we can't use the brain to get out of that stress. That stress is primarily happening in chemical pathways in the body. And eventually your body just takes that stress over. It's like, okay, I'll take the stress. I'm just gonna keep it going. You know, your heart racing, your enteric gut. Yep, yep, let's just keep that stress going. So a really effective way to decrease that stress and help you get to a place where you may be able to think a little more rationally about it are through body therapies. So things like Biomat, salt recharge, salt room, cell recharge, meditation, but often, you know, doing one of these things first can really be helpful. Um, belly breathing, just something as simple as belly breathing or cardiac coherence. But using the body to help us relax is kind of that first step because that, that chemical milieu is really happening um, in the body. It's almost like a hack. It feels like a little bit of a, of a trick to help us manage our anxiety. Of course, Counseling and coaching is always really helpful um, in terms of building resilience, giving us tools to manage our stress, and just helping us with sort of the thought aspect of, st of stress. Exercise is great for the microbiome. We know it's especially good if we combine it with pre and probiotic foods. And then sleep. Um, sleep, so good for the microbiome. It it promotes a healthy microbiome, but we also know that those that have a good microbiome sleep better. And it's really the time of the day when your body detoxifies your brain. So you get all these junk proteins that get all um, cleared out, but if you're not sleeping well, you don't have that same process. So just a plug there for sleep. Um, Really diversity is the key, just kind of a, the take home here. Diversity, if you take nothing else from what I said, eating diverse amount of fruits, but especially vegetables is gonna be great for your microbiome and really help prolong your health and prevent disease. So remember what Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So that's it for my talk, but I do have a couple questions that I think I have just a couple minutes to answer. Um, the first, these two came in before, um, so I'm, I am gonna answer these first and then see if we have any in our, um, in our Q and A. What is the best way to address ongoing heartburn? So heartburn is often, um, 
linked to a few different things. So one is that low stomach acidity. So one way that you can um, re reduce heartburn is by addressing stomach acidity. And you can do that really easily just by seeing if, you know, taking a little bit of apple cider vinegar, which also has enzymes, if you get the organic brags, and put a little bit of that in water, you know, whatever you can tolerate, uh, but definitely add it to water. Um, and you drink that when you're having symptoms of heartburn, that can often help increase the acidity of the stomach and decrease your heartburn. Another reason you may be having heartburn is because of food sensitivities. So doing something like an elimination diet where you remove the most commonly sensitive foods um, can often we find that that really re reduces um, acid reflux that's been chronic. So those are the two kind of main culprits that we see for chronic acid reflux. The next question is, what causes, what causes gassiness in the evening? So in the evening in particular, so your body has natural circadian rhythms, right? But it could also be that um, you're eating more foods that you're sensitive to at night. So gassiness is generally a, uh, you know, very <laughs> um, similar to the last question, gassiness or bloating is often related to either food sensitivities, which are often linked to leaky gut or um, low stomach acidity. Because if you're not digesting your food well, and then it moves to the small intestine, it's going to cause issues. The third reason you may be having gassiness in the evening is that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that makes it just harder to digest. But generally for that um, SIBO, you have more bloating through the day. You would, you would have it kind of with every meal. So those are generally the three causes, food sensitivities, low stomach acidity or poor digestion, which you could help with digestive enzymes or apple cider vinegar or um, uh, bowel, small intestinal bowel overgrowth. Okay, let's see what time, maybe time for one more. So this question is, are indigestion and acid reflux associated with post COVID-19 after effects? If, if so, should it be treated in the same fa fashion as regular indigestion? Um, so it's a good question. What I would say is that probably, you know, COVID, what we're lear knowing about learning about COVID-19 is it can just kind of throw things off in the same way that other viruses and other um, illnesses can throw things off. So it, I do think that if I had a patient that was having a lot of these symptoms post COVID-19, I would address it in the same way I, am, I would be addressing um, a more traditional um, acid reflux, because in functional medicine, what we're really trying to do is see what's the imbalance. So although COVID-19 is new, the effects or the imbalance probably isn't new. And so we look a little deeper and we try to figure out why is that happening? You know, they don't have COVID-19 anymore. So that it's not that it's something that happened when they had COVID-19. So we try to uncover what that was. Um, but short answer would be yes, I would likely treat it as I would another indigestion. And then finally, I think our last question, are there any good pre and probiotic cookbooks? There are some great cookbooks about fermenting foods. Um, and you know what, I'll, I'll post them. I have them at home, but I'm like blanking on what they're called right now. Um, one is called, oh no, there's, there's one that's, yeah, no, I'm going to butcher it. So I'm just going to, I'll put it on the Instagram and then I'll also um, try to find this person that asked the question. But if you look up like fermented foods, those, you can ferment so many of your own foods at home and it's really cheap. They're super yummy, like fermented carrots, fermented pickles, or, you know, these things that you just add a little bit of the probiotics to that, to that batch. And um, it's a great way to really build your microbiome. Good question, I love that. Okay, we are out of time. We are two minutes over. So I appreciate your um, attention today. 
please, again, send any further questions you have to news at Palm Health um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.